But the concept of putting bikes into a room in a studio and branding that studio and selling classes, I made up off the, out, of, out of my head. Now, you know, there are hundreds, thousands of spin studios around the world right now. But at the time, there were none. We're moving from mindfulness, we're moving to be present, we're moving for holistic well being. The rest will come. Whatever it is, it will come. But what's important is that we not worry about what our bodies look like, but how they work. And we worry about our minds. So those three groups, the young women who suddenly were freed of the focus and obsession with the body, the people that hadn't really worked out very much in their lives but felt welcome, and people struggling with mental health challenges. And then there's, of course, people who just want a good exercise and good culture. But those three people, those three groups of people, ch change your lives. And I know this because they send me emails to this day. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for joining me here today at We Are Mentally United podcast. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much. Uh, and for folks who may not have heard of you, can you start by introducing yourself a little bit, share about the work that you're doing and the profession that you're in? Sure. My name is Michael Hosking, PhD. I have a doctorate in evolutionary biology, and I taught at Indiana University and in, in Davidson College for a while. And I left academia and got involved in some other things for a number of years. But ultimately, I got very interested in the science of exercise in the brain and the science of exercise for mental health. And having been an athlete my entire life, and specifically a competitive cyclist for a, a large number of years, I started applying uh, mindfulness-based principles to my exercise, my, my bike riding. And from that, I got very interested in mindful movement. And I ultimately created a brand of indoor cycling called Revo Cycle Mind and Body Cycling. And it was an indoor cycling studio that taught indoor cycling with the mind and style of yoga for the mm -hmm. same reasons. Very nice, very nice. And was this something that you were always interested in in doing in terms of uh, being in this profession or being uh, doing something related to outdoors or is this something that popped by for you? No, no. I, I, I've been an athlete my entire life, but um, I've never been a fitness person. I mean, I've worked out. I lift weights at the gym, but I'm not a fitness person. I'm an athlete. And so I've always worked out and gone to gyms, but I never had the dream of creating a fitness brand. But when I started to recognize the power of this new science of exercise in the brain and exercise for mental health, I, I was just so excited about it and so surprised that the fitness industry had no idea about any of this that I decided I would create this indoor cycling brand and and bring the science of exercise in the brain, exercise for mental health, mindful movement to the fitness world. Little did I know they, they'd never heard of anything like this. So I, I had no ambition to be a fitness brand creator. It's just something I want to do to help people. Yeah, no, with technology evolving, with science evolving every day, I feel like new professions are given birth uh, and interesting projects and interesting things come and ideas come out of uh, it this way. Um, let's move back a little bit. So when you were young, when you were, let's say, in your college days, school days, uh, what was uh, fitness like at that at, at that time? And what how different have you, do you feel like it has become now? Well, I don't know anything about fitness prior to, say, 2010. Because, as I said, I worked out in gyms, but I was not part of the culture. And I've come to understand that fitness is a culture. Mm -hmm. And like any culture... There's a shared set of beliefs, values, practices, language, dress, right? That is a culture. Mm -hmm. Fitness is a culture. I was not a part of that. I was a part of it starting in 2010 when I created the, the Revo Cycle brand. And um, I was shocked. I was absolutely shocked because I had no idea that fitness was the way it was. And you might say, well, what is that? <laughs> way that it is. And I found that people in fitness generally did not like exercise. Mm -hmm. And they treated it as something they had to do in order to get a different body, change the body in some fashion, grow biceps, build a booty, 
shed five pounds, burn fat, burn calories, get a dancer's body and do bar. You know, all of that was, it's all about changing your body. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you with 100% certainty, I have never ridden my bike up to the, you know, 1,200, 1,300 foot high hill over here in order to get ready for summer. Oh. Didn't occur to me <laughs> that I would ride my bike to change my body. I ride mm -hmm. my bike because riding my bike is meditative and peaceful. And I learn about myself in doing it. But fitness, especially then, and going back further than into the 90s and 80s, was almost entirely about exercise sucks, but you have to do it in order to get hot. And then once you're hot, you're going to be happy. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to we're going to make these classes distracting. They're going to be a party on a bike. It's going to be a dance club. All of that is because they presume exercise sucks. So we got to make it fun and entertaining and distracting. And as an athlete, track and field, golf, football, baseball, soccer, kayaking, cycling, am wow. I missing <laughs> football? I, I, mean, am I, I mean, I'm missing some. I was a great athlete and I did all those sports and never once did I do them to change my body. Not once. Mm -hmm. And every athlete I knew in those sports came to love the movement itself and getting better at it, that intrinsic reward to movement. And so to go back to your question, at that time in 2010, I came into the industry with this brand, Indoor Cycling, and I realized my values were just very different from the rest of the industry. Now, the industry is changing a little bit. They've come to recognize that the hyper-focus on the external is not particularly healthy. And they've come to recognize that judging and shaming fat or fat people is not particularly healthy. And so we are seeing the growth of several different kind of streams within fitness, body positive, body neutral fitness, mindful movement is another one that's growing in popularity, holistic well-being, exercise for holistic health, exercise for mental health. All of these different lanes are now growing. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you in 2010, when I created Revo Cycle Mind and Body Cycling, these were very small movements if they existed at all. Yeah. And so I just happened to come up with this synthetic idea around indoor cycling and exercise in general, which was do it mindfully. I, it, it makes me happy. I feel like I'm meditating when I do it. It helps my mental health. It's good for the brain. It is a mindfulness practice. Let's mm -hmm. teach people. This. And, you know, that was just me. That's Michael and Michael's experience in life. And I'm going to, I've learned these things. I'm going to share it with people. All of those threads are now growing. So the industry is changing. It's not, it's nowhere near where it should be, but it is definitely changing. How did how did the idea came along to you? How, how when how was it birthed? Well, um, let me tell you the whole story. In two thousand eight, I suffered very severe depression and PTSD, and it was related to childhood. SA, I don't know what you can say on these channels, right? SA, if we know what that mm -hmm. means, you can if, if they don't know what that means, if you can't use it. No, no, you and, can use it. Can you? Okay, childhood sexual abuse. And in 2008, circumstances in my life were such that it came back and hit me exceptionally hard. I, I was working at the time as a national director of something or another for a major corporation with thousands of people under me, multi-million dollar budgets. And I quit. And I came home because I couldn't function. And I started seeing a psychiatrist and a, and a therapist and I took medications for two and a half years. And I took every possible antidepressant available and every possible combination. Mm -hmm. I took anti-anxiety drugs on top of those, two or three different types. And then on top of those, I took what they call atypical antipsychotics, which are often used now in conjunction with antidepressants, if the antidepressants are not working. 
So mm -hmm. I, was, I was taking three classes of drugs at high doses and doing nothing, doing nothing. And I went into my psychiatrist one day and she looked me, looked at me and she said, Michael, I don't know what to do for you. I've never seen anything like this and nothing's working. So I don't know what to do. I'm going to put you on lithium. And that scared me. Mm -hmm. I now know it probably shouldn't have scared me as much as it did, but at the time it really scared me. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, you have a PhD. You were national director of a, a very big company. You were a college professor at Indiana University and Davidson College. You are a decent person. You treat people well. And your life has come to this. You're going to be sitting around on lithium. And I thought, I've got to do something. And all I could think of were the three things that used to make me happy. And they're all <laughs> within 20 feet of me right now. Right to my left here are two guitars. Yeah. Four feet that way is a stereo record player, CD player. And 10 feet that way is my bike. I hadn't touched all three of those in over two years. Hadn't touched them. And I thought, all right, let's start doing something that used to make you happy. And I thought, I'm going to ride my bike. But that was too much for me to tackle, right? When you suffer from serious depression mm -hmm. and PTSD, the idea of getting all your stuff together and going for a ride, that was too much. But I thought, I can find my shorts. And then the next day, I can find my jersey. And then the next day, my shoes. And the next day, my socks. And over a period of about five or six days, I got all my stuff together. And the only thing left to do was put air in the tires. And I did. And I said, all right, go for it. And I went two miles out and two miles back, which is four miles total. And if you know people that ride, seriously, four miles is not even a warm up, mm -hmm. not even close. And yet, after that four mile ride, I felt better. Not perfect, but better. So I thought I'll do this again tomorrow. And I strung together several days of it. And the next week, when I went to see my psychiatrist, I told her, I'm feeling better. I've been riding my bike. I don't know what's going on here. And then the week after, I told my psychiatrist, I'm not taking these medications anymore. And she, I mean, her eyes just got huge, huge. She's like, oh, I would not recommend that, Michael. No, I would not recommend that. And I said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit them. And I did. I quit the medications. And I kept riding my bike for longer and longer rides. And that got me interested in what the heck was going on. And because I have a PhD in biology, I know how to dive in the literature. And also I'm interested in it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I dove into the medical literature and I started discovering things I had never been taught in graduate school. And that's what started me on this path. And I'm happy to go into more detail, but that's the backstory to what got me on this path in my life. Well, that's that's really inspiring. Thank, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I work with young, young folks. I provide them therapy services. Majority of them are aged 2 to 12. And I would say 60 to 70, 65 or 70% of these kids are suffering uh, or are struggling with abuse, are struggling with sexual abuse from very close members of their family and it's it's really difficult for them uh, yeah. and one of the things I always encourage families is to take them outdoors like do park activities take them on bike rides go into the mountains uh, because when you're out there when you're in that space when you're running when you're jogging when you're biking different chemicals release and you you, you may know much more in depth about uh, these chemicals but different chemical the body releases different chemicals and they are really beneficial yeah and let me let me Add to what you're saying there. Before I rode my bike, I used to take, when I was not feeling well, I used to take walks up in the hills back there behind me. We have some beautiful forested areas back there. We have a big arboretum near the forested area. And I used to take what I would call my mindfulness walks in the, in the arboretum. Mm -hmm. And my goal was to cover as little distance as possible in an hour and during that time to pay as much attention as I possibly could 
to everything around me, in particular the trees. And so I would stop and touch the tree and feel its bark, and I'd describe the bark, the feeling of the bark to myself, or even out loud. I would rub my hand up and down the bark. I would pull the leaves. I'd look at them. I'd smell them. I'd feel them. Mm -hmm. I'd listen for the wind in the leaves or the needles. And I'd take it all in and try to really be as present as possible with those trees through the sensations, the sight, the sound, the touch, the smell. So I used my senses to get out of my head. Mm -hmm. And I remember them with a great deal of, of joy when, when I think about them right now. But mindfulness yeah. works. It's 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 really really effective and it's really really beautiful how how it affects and how the role that mindfulness plays because even with with these kids that I work with a lot of them are prescribed medicines or a lot of them are unable to uh, are either so they have so many body dysregulations in terms of anger in terms of trying to express themselves because these are young ones really really young kids. And they sometimes they are prescribed, and sometimes I would also say they are over prescribed medicines in a lot of cases, yeah. um, because one dosage starts working good, then the kid starts becoming used to within two or three months of that dosage, then it's either up, then it has a different effect, then parents change the medicine, and it just it just causes a lot of long term effects and does not really solve a lot of problems uh, uh, for these kids, and some of my practice and some of my work is to take them out for walks is to make them touch the trees make them use these senses because i feel like nature is the best medicine uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of different ways uh, and just being around by the river or just being sitting under the tree just taking some deep breaths just hearing the birds chirp that's that's very 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 therapeutic and it's very simplistic yet very therapeutic I totally agree. I totally agree. And the medicines, you know, they have their place. There, there's a book your listeners might be interested in. It's called uh, Anat Anatomy of an Epidemic. And it's by Robert Whitaker. This is not easy reading. It is not light reading. Mm -hmm. But if people are interested in the history of the psychopharmaceuticals in the United States, I would highly recommend they read this book. It goes into great detail on how these drugs were developed, how they were tested, how they were approved by the FDA. They pull research reports that were never submitted to the FDA mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. you don't have to submit all of your research to the yeah. FDA. You just mm -hmm. need to submit two or three that might show what you want. You could have 100 that show mm -hmm. what you want. My mind blew up when I read about how these researches and peer review reviews are more, most of them are done because you're totally right. You you can you only have to submit what you want to submit and why would a pharmaceutical company or uh, people working up over there going to submit negative data? or right. like... Yeah. Yeah. And this book pulled all the research articles, not research articles, the data that was not submitted mm -hmm. to the FDA. It's a heavy, heavy book. But if you have listeners who are prescribers, psychiatrists, medical doctors, I think they would be interested in it. I gave the book to my psychiatrist, the one I was describing earlier. Mm -hmm. I gave it. She read it. And she said, Michael, because of this book, I'm changing my prescribing practices. Wow. It's that powerful. That's so it's powerful. powerful. The Anatomy of an Epidemic by Robert Whitaker. Uh, I'll definitely add up a link uh, in the description for the listeners if they want to check out the book because it's scary, especially when when uh, because a lot of times what happens or what I see in in my sessions are kids sometimes looking like zombies because they cannot function properly because of how heavy these dosages are. And some of them might have a positive effect. Some of them might be helpful for a lot of folks, but we are all built differently. And it it's more like a test and trial process, I feel like, with these medicines. If this was, does not work, that you can try out that work. If that one does not work, you can try it with that the other one. But the whole thing that happens while you're trying different medicines is 
your brain's chemicals and your brain's mechanism is constantly changing because of those medicines which which damages causes damage Robert Whitaker goes into that in the book. And, and by the way, you're right. Try this one, try this one, try this one, try this combination, now this combination, add on top of this, this one, this one, or this one. I, I tried three to four different atypical antipsychotics, five to seven different antidepressants, three different anti-anxiety drugs. Mm. And they all have effects on your brain. They have, not just your brain, your mood is also affected constantly. Memory is affected. Um, sometimes uh, I've been in sessions with, with kids who have spoken to me and shared that in moments of anger, in moments of outbursts, they completely black out uh, some, sometimes because since they started taking up these drugs. So there are a lot of different effects that, that it causes. And we still don't know what the long-term effects would be for these of, for these yeah. drugs when these kids grow up to reach 40, 50, 60, 70 totally agree. years totally of agree. age. Just want warning readers that if they're going to read that book, it is heavy, heavy going. It is very heavy going. Uh, definitely, like, uh, encourage, just just to educate yourself, uh, listeners, like, please give this book a read if, if you get a chance. I'll read it myself for sure, but I take your recommendation really highly. Uh, and it's this is a topic that is really close to me because I see these kinds of effects happening on daily basis. Uh, however, like uh, coming back to river cycle, when you started biking, when you started going out, uh, in after how many days you, did you started feeling up a change? You mentioned that you told your therapist within by the next session, but did you see a gradual improvement, or was that was there a sharp shooting improvement? You'd say. It was pretty rapid for me. The first day, I felt better. I didn't feel cured. I felt better. I felt positivity. Mm -hmm. I felt something positive that first day. And it continued as I kept writing. I would say I stopped taking the medicines after two to three weeks of writing daily. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, within two to three weeks, I felt good enough to stop taking medicines yeah and i also feel like as human beings we were always designed to be outside we were never supposed to be indoors in a lot of different ways and like with covid what happened is that we we were closed and we were asked to be indoors and we got accustomed to it which is why i feel like a lot a very few amount of people are now getting out they get done with work they come home they feel exhausted and then they just crash out and watch something on the tv or on their phones or any other technological device those evening jogs those evening walks i feel like have decreased especially post covid because of a lot of fears that folks have around yeah that you know when we look back covid will be a turning point in our society's acceptance of mental health struggles. Because prior to it, if you went to a therapist or psychiatrist, it was considered kind of shameful, right? You don't want to be mm -hmm. seen walk, walking in the door of a therapist or psychiatrist's office. During COVID, everyone was talking about mental health, right? It mm -hmm. suddenly became one of the most popular topics in media. And I think that's a good thing. And we'll look back and say, yep, in COVID, everybody felt stressed. Everybody felt anxious. I mean, think about it. Think about it. A novel virus is spreading through the population. No one can see it. No one knows where it is. And it might kill you. Mm -hmm. That is a movie. Yeah, that is a movie, and mm -hmm. that is scary. And now the government is so scared that they say, "Shut your businesses down, shut your restaurants down, and stay home." Do you remember this? Yeah, yeah. This is scary. It is. And you know, we all just kind of took it step by step. But think about it. You know, someday, thirty, forty years from now, Grandpa. Tell me about when COVID came. And, well, businesses shut down, stores shut down, coffee shops shut down. Everyone just stayed home. Schools university, shut down. University schools shut down. Students were sent down. back. 
somewhere in February or March. They didn't ha- they didn't get to complete their school year. That's completely. I know. Unheard. I mean, it was a scary time. So I think a good thing to come out of COVID is that people were talking about mental health because everyone was having difficulties with anxiety and stress and depression and lack of socialization. Mm-hmm. So that's a good thing from COVID. And I, I I hope that we maintain our focus on that and continue throwing resources at it. Yeah, well, that's definitely a good thing. And I feel like that also happened particularly because people were, for the first few months, people or for the first few weeks, people were just home. Uh, so they got the time to actually spend time with themselves, uh, time that you're, they're usually busy outside doing their professional job, work, running chores and stuff. They actually got time to spend with themselves. And I feel like that made a lot of people not comfortable. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going the opposite direction. And yeah. I was going to tell you the opposite. I agree with you. I think they were forced to spend time with themselves. They could no longer distract themselves with going to the bars or going to the stores and shopping. They could no longer distract themselves in groups of friends or coffee shops mm-hmm. or home with themselves. Yeah. But I, I also feel like when it ended and now things are becoming back to normal, I feel like people have become accustomed to staying indoors. It's more safer. It's more easier to stay indoors than let's say go, go, go on a bike run or like just go on a jog. Um, and I hope that changes up soon too, because, and I'm mostly also talking about the younger folks because the younger folks are constantly either at their schools, colleges, universities, or are on their technological devices. And th- those people really have to get out and do exercises and do different things that keeps their body active, um, uh, not just for their mental health, but also for their physical health. Totally agree. Yeah. And that's a whole nother issue, right? The rise of the smartphones, a handheld supercomputer, you know, with addictive apps on it that will keep you on it for hours and hours on end. That's a mm. whole nother issue. Yeah, yeah. How how would you say RevoCycle is, uh, helps you with mindfulness and stuff? What are some features or what are some techniques and things that you, you folks implement? Yeah, uh, for I don't know if you've ever been to a spin class at a spin studio or maybe even in the gym, but indoor cycling classes, especially around the very same time I created my brand, were mostly influenced by a place out of New York City called Soul Cycle. In fact, when I came up with my idea of a fitness studio with indoor cycling, group indoor cycling set to music, There were no spin studios in the United States, except I later learned in New York City, SoulCycle. But the concept of putting a bunch of bikes in a room in a separate studio, gyms had spin classes, but the concept of putting bikes into a room in a studio and branding that studio and selling classes, I made up. Off the, out, of, out of my head. Now, you know, there are hundreds, thousands of spin studios around the world right now. But at the time, there were none. There were yoga studios. There are lots mm-hmm. of those. And I thought, well, it's like a yoga studio, but we're going to do it with cycling. I mean, mm-hmm. gyms sell yoga, but there are yoga studios and they survive. So I'm going to do boutique cycling. Mm-hmm. And I did, I mean, I made this idea up. <laughs> it's crazy. Then I learned Soul Cycle existed later, but they they beat me by only maybe a, a year or so. But anyway, if you've ever been to these classes, especially Soul Cycle class, but many many different brands are influenced by Soul Cycle. They copy Soul Cycle, and Soul Cycle's approach is that it's a party on a bike, and they bring dance moves of the upper body into the cycling exercise itself. And the music is like 120 decibels, you know, club music. The room is extremely hot. And the instructor is yelling constantly over the 120 decibel music while people are doing all these different choreographed moves on the bike. So it's chaotic. (laughs) It is chaotic and loud and stressful. 
And Revo cycle, mind and body cycling, as I said at the outset today, it's like yoga, but on a bike. It's mindfulness-based movement. It's body and breath awareness. It's good posture. It's calm instruction. <laughs> it's no yelling. It's like yoga class, but with indoor cycling. And yeah, you can work hard. You can work very hard. You don't need people yelling at you to work hard. In fact, it's better if they're not. It's better if you find it within mm -hmm. instead of having someone else motivate you. And someone yelling at you is really not motivation that you want in the first place. But our, our classes are absolutely unique. I've never seen another place like it. It's, it's a mind and practice of yoga, but with indoor cycling exercise. Yes. And like, is there an instructor who's running these classes or are those, there video packages? Well, we had a studio until COVID hit and we no longer have a studio. Well, the studio is still there. I quit paying rent. <laughs> <laughs> And I was lucky because as a PhD biologist, I knew what was going to happen with COVID. Mm -hmm. I knew exactly what was going to happen. I, I, I predicted it. I told people. I sent an email to my customer base on March 15th of 2020. I think March 15th, 6 a.m. And I explained to them. They had a novel coronavirus entering a population where there is no immunity and no vaccines will spread like crazy and millions of people will get sick. And it'll take at least a year and a half to develop a vaccine and hospitals will be overrun. Because by this point, we knew the severity of the illness. If I didn't know the severity of the illness, I would not have told him that. But at that point, we knew. Mm -hmm. So my lease was up for renewal two weeks after that. After March 15th, my lease was up for renewal two weeks. Mm -hmm. But I, I didn't renew because mm -hmm. I knew that they would have to shut down businesses. And I knew that I'd have to be paying rent on a building in a space I couldn't use. So I was lucky. We, we shut it down. We, just, we still have online classes. We do it through a platform called recess.tv. But I kind of got it in my head because the studio is still there, three blocks from here. Yeah. The beautiful tiers I built, the beautiful sound system, the beautiful gigantic overhand, overhead airfoil fan, the beautiful desk, the beautiful lobby. It's also there. So I, I have thoughts about partnering up with people to reopen that. I think we're at the time now where businesses can stop worrying about potential shutdowns or even people being worried about coming into a closed space. Yeah, well, I, I hope you guys do open it for sure because I think that will be a very interesting space for a lot of folks and will benefit a lot of people too. Oh, it, it was remarkable. The, the It really changed lives. It changed people's lives. It changed most fundamentally their relationship with exercise. Yeah. Can you and, share a little bit? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, no. I was just going to ask you if you can share a little bit of, of, around those success stories or feedbacks that you may have received. Yeah, sure. Sorry, I'm getting a halo here from the sun. <laughs> um, Looks cinematic. The, the success <laughs> stories. These are all cranked up. The success stories. So... You should know that when I created the brand, I had in my head that we would never talk about calories burned, changing your body in any fashion, losing fat, getting ready for summer, new year, new you, bikini season, shedding for the wedding, and any other- I love that. I love those initiatives so much. <laughs> we- made a commitment that we'd never talk about any of those. None. And the reason is because when I was teaching at Davidson College, I was with somebody who was recovering from an eating disorder. And, and she was back to her regular weight, but her mind still carried 
all of these ideas. And she opened my eyes to the marketing of the fitness world. And she told me about how that influenced her and fed into her eating disorder and helped it thrive. And so you already know my ideas about exercise and brain, mindfulness, exercise, exercise for holistic well-being. Those are the things that are important to me. So it was really no big deal for me to say, plus, we're never going to talk about burning calories or getting ready for the summer because that stuff just does damage anyway. So we're not going to talk about it. So th those are the two parts that change people's lives. There are young women that would come into my studio being fitness people, right? And they'd walk in and say, hey, is, is, are, are your classes fun? And I'd say, I don't, I don't know. They're not trying to be fun. I don't think so. I don't think they're fun. And they're just like, what? And then they'd say, well, mm -hmm. do you burn a lot of calories in your classes? I said, well, uh, I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. And they go, what? <laughs> like they couldn't grasp. Yeah, that is, yeah. Just, that is saying it's not fun and we don't know how many calories you burn. And I'd say to them, look, we're moving from mindfulness. We're moving to be present. We're moving for holistic well-being. The rest will come. Whatever it is, it will come. But what's important is that we not worry about what our bodies look like, but how they work. And we worry about our minds. And more than a few times, these young women would start crying when I would tell them that. Oh. And the reason is because they've been told their entire lives that their worth and their value is in how their body looks. And so they've been going to fitness classes for their entire lives in order to change how their body looks so they can build up some worth. And here's a guy saying to them, you're worthy on your own. And movement is good for us. It makes us feel good. It makes us feel good about ourselves. And we will not judge you on how you look. And we will not care if you change your body. That caused people to cry. That's one angle of it. The other angle was heavier people or people who hadn't exercised a lot felt very welcome in my studio because they could grasp that our culture was such that no one's talking about bodies. His website doesn't have before after pictures. His website doesn't have sexy photo shoots of their instructors. His instructors are normal looking people who treat me with respect as a human being and are not yelling at me. Or saying something like, come on, get it, summer's coming. And so those people who had avoided fitness because of its culture found us to be very welcoming and they loved us. And then there were the people who were struggling with mental health challenges. And I would talk with them. And I would share my story. I would write about my story. I mean, it's, I'm wide open. Mm -hmm. and I would tell them my story. And I would say, I get it. I very much get this. Try, try doing this two or three times a week. And talk to me. Come to class. We'll go get coffee afterwards. And we'll talk. Mm -hmm. And that changed their lives. So those three groups, yeah. the young women who suddenly were freed of the focus and obsession with the body, the people that hadn't really worked out very much, in their lives, but felt welcome and people struggling with mental health challenges. And then there's, of course, people who just want a good exercise and good culture. But those three people, those three groups of people ch change their lives. And mm -hmm. I know this because they send me emails to this day. I see them in the streets when I walk around. I see them every after this interview. I'm walking to Safeway. There's a very good chance I will run into an old customer. And they'll say, oh, Michael, how you doing? Oh, my God. You know. I go ride my bike outside, and when I'm in the middle of the hill, I hear your voice. I hear your voice telling me to relax my shoulders and breathe deeply from the belly. And I hear your voice saying, don't look at the top of the hill. It's just one pedal stroke at a time, one at a time. The hill is the hill. What we are working with is the next 15 feet. Well, well that's, that's super powerful. Like, that's... That's really inspiring, Michael. 
because these are the kinds of changes we should be making up within our communities. These are the kind of changes we should be making for folks or bringing folks this kind of support. Because I feel like you took off a huge weight off their shoulders. Mm -hmm. uh, how how you are perceived or how your body should look, that that adds up to a lot of like you know societal pressure and all these things, social media pressure. And it 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 adds an extra layer of weight. Uh, also the numbers and statistics like oh you have to be this weight or you have to be uh, this is your bmi or uh, or 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 something of that sort or these many calories you have to burn all these numbers these add more stresses and these add i feel like more more concerns and more problems that people don't identify with yeah there is a huge body image issue in our country and it's fed in large part by the fitness industry. They want you to feel bad about your body. Mm -hmm. It's good for business. Cosmetics, fashion, diet industry. Social media. Social media, Hollywood. All of them contribute. Diet industry, fitness industry, absolutely 100% benefit from you hating your body. Mm -hmm. And so they work very hard to make sure that you do. Because when you do, you will pay them money to change your body. And at least with fitness, they could argue that that's super good for you. Exercise is good for you. So even if you're doing it to change your body, even if your body doesn't change, you're still doing something that's healthy for you. The diet industry is evil because they know diets don't work long term. They know that. Mm -hmm. They have the data. There are 50, 70 years of data showing that diets work for, you know, 10, 4, 6% of people long term. In other words, 90 plus percent of people who take on a diet will eventually gain their weight back and, and more. Mm -hmm. They know this. They 100% know it. And that's why it's such a good business to be in. Mm -hmm. Because you will never get your clientele to be at a point where they don't need your service. Because they know every diet will ultimately result in 90% or more of the people doing it failing. And they also know that when someone fails on a diet, who do they blame? This is a rhetorical question. Who do they blame? If I started such and such diet, I'm going to do it 100%. After 10 weeks, I'm struggling with it. After 14 weeks, I'm kind of half off it. After 20 weeks, I'm completely off it. After 40 weeks, I've gained 20 pounds more than what I had when I started. At the end of that little episode, who would I blame? The diet? Mm -mm. You're going to blame yourself. Yeah. And the diet industry makes sure you blame yourself. They are not the ones telling people 90% of people who start a diet will ultimately gain more weight back. They're not telling people that. They know it, mm -hmm. but they're not telling. That's a story for another day. Fitness and diet industry thrive off people having um, bad body image and hating their bodies. And it also causes long-term stresses because like, even if you have reached your weight goal, let's say if it's 60 pounds, 70 pounds, you have reached your weight goal, you're constantly on the check that, oh, if I have this extra pastry, this is going to increase these many calories. This, this is going to happen. And then if you increase three or four pounds, you're like, oh, my God, all hell Correct. is breaking loose because I've worked so hard on getting this body and now I'm gaining weight again. Precisely. It is a treadmill. You can never get off. Mm -hmm. And you are operating from fear almost all the time. And therefore, your trips to the gym become compulsive. Your eating becomes compulsive and obsessive. And you can never step off that treadmill because you're always worried. Even if, as you said, you get to your goal weight, right? That is not enough. That mm -hmm. is never enough. It is never enough. And therefore... You do not settle down. You do not go, oh, I did it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And by the way, 
in the fitness industry in particular, you will see if you study the history of it, body fats, body fats. Different body shapes come in and out of fashion. Mm -hmm. And just study your history. There's a great person at the new school in New York City called Natalia Petrozela. She's a faculty member there, and she writes about the history of the fitness industry. And she's a fitness instructor. And you will see, wait a minute, the fitness industry is selling bodies like it's selling widgets in a store. And therefore, within fitness, you will never have the perfect body because the perfect body is determined by whatever they're selling at any given moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you're always uneasy, always not quite there in mm -hmm. fitness. Which is and, stressful, to your point. Yeah, it, it adds a lot of additional stresses to your life. Um, what's the component and how do you utilize music in at RevoCycle? Yeah, I, I, I'm so happy to hear that question. You can't see it, but right there is a whole stack of records. And then right here are my classical and jazz records. And I've already told you about the turntable. I am a music lover. I think music has the power to transform our lives, transform our hearts inside out. Mm -hmm. Music is to me the greatest art form ever. And I love it so much that I want other people to love it. I want them to see what I see. I want them to feel what I feel. I want them to feel understood by some lyrics. I want them to feel moved by a Mahler symphony, the way I'm moved by a Mahler symphony. And I, therefore, have gotten into high-end stereos because they extract more of the emotion out of the music. Mm -hmm. And they extract music from records in a way that I just don't feel is the same with CDs or cassette tapes. So, you know, music lovers love the records because they feel like they communicate more truth. And so I carried this all into the studio. So one can imagine that I designed a sound system that was, I am 100% certain, the best in the country. 100% certain of it. Because in most fitness studios, sound systems are just whatever. They call Joe AV, right? Joe's Joe's Joe AV. Joe, I need a sound system for a studio. It needs to be loud. Joe comes in, throws some corner speakers in, some amplifier, some mixer, and then they just crank it up. And what they get is distorted, awful sounding music. But they don't care because they don't know any better, right? Mm-hmm. And by the way, that distorted, awful sound of music boosts the stress response in the body. So they're actually increasing stress in their listeners, in their clients. I designed a sound system that was high fidelity, hi-fi, right? And powerful, I mean, very powerful, but we didn't play it loud. And, and, and that's where people get lost. And like the louder, the better. No, the louder, the more distorted, the louder, the more blown out the ears, the louder, the stress response, the louder, the more glucocorticoids circulate in your body. What you want is quality delivered at a reasonable volume. And so we did that. We, had, we never went above 85 decibels. And I can tell you for a fact that a soul cycle class would be 110, 120 decibels. And that's, this is log scale, right? <laughs> this is not... Percentage, this is doubling, multiple, yeah. doubles, three, four hundred percent louder. Mm -hmm. So there's that. The structure of the sound system was very important to me. And then the type of music. We banned all, all music that had obscenities. We banned all music that had misogyny. And we tried to stay with what we call kind of modern indie style music. But we also used a lot of instrumental, electronic instrumental music. Like, say, someone named, there's a guy named uh, John Hopkins who mm -hmm. does beautiful electronic music. He's a trained composer, but his medium is electronic music. 
So we would do that kind of thing as well. And then every two weeks we did what we call vinyl night, where we would talk about a particular record for a couple of weeks, learn about the artist, learn about the time, learn about how it was recorded, learn about the people playing on it. And then on a Friday night at 6 p.m., we'd have a class called Vinyl Night, where I played a full record on a Techniques SL 1200 turntable, <laughs> front to back, and we sat with the artist statement. Very little talking, almost no talking, just the record playing to a room of 25 people through a killer sound system. And we're just being with the art, being with it, learning what the artist intended as best we could. Talk about tears. People would cry during these because they were overwhelmed with the emotional content of the music that was bathing them, right? Just surrounding them in high fidelity. And it wasn't me. I'm not yelling. I'm not inspiring them. I, I don't want to. Yeah. Here's a record, everybody. Side A. The rhythm for this song is 73 beats. Set up to that. I'll give you a cue for how much resistance. Talk to you in a little bit. It's powerful. Music was a central, central part of what we did. Well, well, music is extremely, extremely powerful. Very, very powerful. And I feel like it has the power to cure and to problem solve and to provide ease to a lot of people and probably in my headspace, all the people, all you have to do is find your music or all you have to do is the find the frequency or the kind of genre that you like in that music, because it, I see that every single day at my practice with parents, just ask them to listen to some music, ask them to listen up to some bands that they used to listen up as a child for parents. The, their body dysregulation goes away, their irritation goes away, their yeah. the constantly being cranky around their kid goes away because they're connecting their mind and body with these frequencies because a lot of it has to do with the frequencies. Oh, you know, I tell people, we humans invented music for a reason. Right? We, I mean, mm -hmm. it just happened that, that we end up playing drums or making stringed instruments. I mean, that didn't happen by chance. We did that on purpose mm -hmm. so that we could sit around and play them. That brought us some joy and happiness. Yeah. Music is probably as old as us. We were probably playing drums by the rock or by the rocks or in the mountains. When, I love that when... thinking, right? Like when did music start for humans? Well, birdsong existed before we did. Yeah. So you know early humans heard birdsong. Even right? water sound. And, and, what, and what? Even water sound. Of course, which is musical, and you can measure the frequencies of it. And it's mm -hmm. peaceful, right? Go camp next to a stream. Mm -hmm. like here we have some beautiful mountain streams coming out of the mountains, bubbling with ice cold water, camping next to those. Ah, beautiful. So, yeah, we early humans heard, heard songs, heard noises, heard calls from animals, heard the water bubbling. And at some point, we started making it. And you were right. The first ones were probably rhythmic only. Mm -hmm. Probably. I mean, we'd have to call them a musicologist at this point. But <laughs> probably, right? That makes sense. That Because even when we are bored, we don't have anything to do. What we start doing, we start drumming making on our rhythms. table or making some little bit of rhythms here and there. And it's extremely powerful because I've seen... I've seen different kinds of disorders being improved with music. It's not just for one, like anxiety, depression, uh, nightmares, uh, ADHD. It helps you focus in certain situations. Uh, trauma. Music oh. can, like, it, it can really, really, really problem solve or provide support or provide comfort to people struggling with all disorders or any disorders, I would say. Do you know about binaural beats? Mm -mm. No. Make a note. Will you do this for your listeners? Yes, I will. You, binaural beats is a type of music that you can access on Spotify. You can access it on Tidal. All you got to do is type in binaural beats. And that's B I N A U R A L, I think. Or A U R A L. Yeah. Binaural. That means two ears. Binaural. Mm -hmm. 
And if you're any of your listeners or you play guitar, you'll know what I'm talking about if you tune your guitar by hitting the harmonics on the strings. Guitar players will know what I'm talking about. It's when you just touch the string. You don't press it down into the fret. You just mm -hmm. touch it with the meat of your finger. And you can get it to ring what's called a harmonic. And to tune your fifth and your sixth string on your guitar, you touch it this fret and that fret, and they will ring at the same frequency. But if they're off, by even a tiny bit, those frequencies cross each other. If they're in, in tune, they never cross. The point at which they cross, if they're out of tune, you will hear as as they cross. The more they cross, the more beats you hear. The closer they are in the tune, the fewer beats you hear. And then just change the string a little bit. Uh, no more beats. Those are beats. When two frequencies cross over each other, imagine the sine wave, right? Where they cross. Mm -hmm. You hear that in your ears as a beat. Mm -hmm. Not a beat on a drum, but a beat. And you'll hear it. Have you, anybody who plays guitar, you know what I'm talking about. If you have somebody that plays guitar and you don't, have them show you that. You'll hear it. It's easy to hear. Yeah. So binaural beats is a type of music where the left channel and the right channel have slightly different frequencies. And they are forming beats as those frequencies overlap. But those beats are forming inside your brain. Mm. Because you're hearing with each ear, if you have headphones on, you're hearing different frequencies. And then your brain is hearing those beats. And there is some research, not a lot, but there's some research that shows certain frequencies that you can produce by changing the frequencies that are crossing over each other, right? Mm -hmm. You can create different frequencies of beats. You can create four per minute, 100 per minute, 300 per minute. 500 per minute hertz, right? Frequencies per minute, per, per second or per minute. So you can go online, find binaural beats, and you can listen to them. And I use them. I use them when I'm stressed out, and I put them on. Now, it could just be the intentionality of putting them on that does it. I don't think there's a ton of basic research on these, but I find it very peaceful. And the reason I'm telling you this is because we had classes where I would put on a binaural beat soundtrack. And we only had two speakers, remember, stereo. And so 85, 90% of the room was in that stereo field. And they were getting binaural beats coming into their heads over 45, 50 minutes as we did just a meditative ride with almost no talking at all for me. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Has music always been something that you've gone to as a child or... Uh, even in your younger days, to find comfort? Yeah, very much. I can remember four years old, sitting in front of the console stereo my mom and dad had. Console stereos, people don't know what those are. The big wooden pieces of furniture where the speakers are built in. And then in the middle, there's a lid, and you've got your record player and your radio, whatever, and, and then there's storage underneath that for your records. Big, huge piece of uh, you know, furniture. And all the families in the 70s and 80s had those from the 70s, and we had, and I would sit at that thing for hours listening to my mom's records, just fascinated by how the music sounded, by the melodies, by how the equipment worked. Like, how does music come from this? It's incredible. And I was emotionally touched by those songs, even as a little, little kid. I was deeply touched emotionally by these songs. And I would listen to someone like Barry Manilow, right? I don't even know if people know who he is anymore. But that guy was huge in the 70s. And mm -hmm. he's great. Look him up if you don't know who he is. He's an amazing singer. and He wrote amazing songs. But he touched me deeply with his music, even when I was just a young, young kid. And I, that has carried with me my entire life, all through grade school, high school, college, grad school, up till now. Up till now. I love yeah. it. I love music. And I love to share it with people, especially love to share it with people. Love to hear that. Can you share a little bit about your love for playing guitar and how that that has helped you in your journey? Sure. Yeah. You know, I started guitar when I was in sixth grade. And 
sister Madeline Mary, my sixth grade teacher, played guitar. And I realized I didn't want to I didn't want to play an instrument that a woman played. I mean, I just I was a little boy, right? And mm -hmm. it's none plays guitar. It didn't seem like a, a boyish thing to be doing. So I quit. And then in high school, I came to realize, dang it, I wish I played guitar now. So I, I got a guitar and I just started figuring it out. Took a month or two of lessons. But other than that, I just figured it out on my own. And it became for me a meditative practice and a joyfulness practice long before I knew anything about either of those, right? I, I would sit for hours, hours playing my guitar. And I knew no theory. I knew nothing about chords or um, keys, or scales. I knew nothing, but I had a good ear. And I started to figure out chords. And then I started to figure out things that you could add on to a chord. And then another one. And then I started to hear in records. Ah, that's the thing. And like anybody in the 60s and 70s, listen to any rock star. will tell you, in the 60s and 70s, you just sat with your records, your cassette tapes. That's what you did. You just sat there and you figured it out. And it, you just did it forever. These days, over COVID, I got a new electric guitar. And I decided I was going to learn music theory which I never knew. I, I mean, I, I've played for a long time and I'm good, but I never knew any theory. And I certainly couldn't solo. I'm good at acoustic rhythm guitar. I knew nothing about soloing up and down the neck. And I, like, I had no idea what these people were doing. And I couldn't figure it out. And so I got an electric guitar at the start of COVID and went to YouTube and started going, all right, solo, soloing, scales for soloing. I was like, oh, there's a whole bunch of scales. And I just started memorizing them up and down the neck, up and down the neck. Pentatonic scale, okay, okay. Relative minor gun, okay. Major, okay. Minor, okay. <laughs> then modes, modes, what are modes? Okay, modes. Oh, whoa, what are those? Figured those out. And, you know, it's right there, my, my beloved electric guitar. I never play music. I just learn scales and modes and techniques on my guitar. And it just brings me great joy. It just brings me great joy to learn. And then to see it actually happen, like to actually execute a lick that somebody said, you know, five, five Eric Clapton licks from 1968. Okay. Huh. I can execute those now. And I understand why they work and I understand where he was coming from. Aha. Uh -huh. That feels good to me. Great. I never, I don't even have an app. I just plug it in my computer. I never, <laughs> I just sit there with it. So it, to me, it's a mindfulness practice and it's a joyfulness practice. It brings me joy to learn. And it brings, it satisfies my mind to understand things. So that's what I do. That's beautiful. Uh, I personally don't play any instruments, but music is that for me. Like m music is something that I can listen to that brings me comfort, brings me joy, brings me sadness. Like I can listen to music and during any emotional mood that I am in whether I'm happy sad even before before recording these podcasts there is this song hall of fame from the script that I listen to because that's one song that makes me focus instantly so right before doing something important right before hopping on a call I listen to that song I feel aligned I feel centered and then I do that thing that's important because it really helps me get into the zone I would say or get into the mode of working Beautiful. Absolutely. You know, that reminds me, one of my instructors, who was not a music lover like me when she first got hired, but she became one, because <laughs> I just kept talking about how important music was in our classes, how important it was to let the music breathe, right? Don't talk over it. The music, the, the producer, writers, singers, performers, lots of people worked on this. Let it breathe. Let it. Let them do their work. And she became very, very good at music in her classes. And she stumbled upon the idea that she'd use a dead mouse song. You know who dead mouse is? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I love dead mouse. Yeah, so she would use a dead mouse song about two minutes before her class was to start. And this was Sunday morning, there'd be four, you know 25 people in there milling about, saying hi, setting up their bikes. And she had some random music playing, right? On the sound system. But then she'd bring up her playlist with that Dead Mouse song. 
play it, change the volume just a tiny bit. And after a few weeks of that, the room changed every time that song came on. Because everyone knew, get on your bike. Everyone's mood shifted to now, oh, this reminds me of being peaceful and focused. This reminds me of how good I feel when I ride. This reminds me of being so present in my body. It just shifted. It was amazing. And I'm thinking of that with your song for when you get ready for your podcast or some other things you have to do. Yeah, it's it's literally a ritual now. Like even yeah. an impo- important meeting, even when I'm, I take an Uber to work you know, uh, mostly, even when I'm on my way to work, it just awakens me up in, in some way. Uh, and it's it's a very it's a very powerful feeling. It's very powerful. I love that story about your music. Who'd you say was the script? The script, uh, Hall of Fame from them. Do I know that song? Would have been a pop- was that a popular song? It's a popular song. I, I think you may have if you know the script, you may you may definitely may have heard of the script. Didn't they do like a heart wrenching song too? They've I'm getting a couple of good songs. Yeah, look, look, look up oh. about it. It's 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 a really good song. Uh, and even at, a lot of athletes use music as um, a tool to gear up yeah. and get into the emotions of the game because I follow yeah. a lot of soccer and a lot of these soccer players uh, and football players have different playlists before the big games. They very much do. Absolutely. I just watched the College World Series baseball and Tennessee in particular, I can't remember if the other teams did, but Tennessee players – they have a walk-up song. So every time a batter is getting ready to come up to the plate, that player gets their own song played over the stadium sound system. Huh. And walking up to the plate as their song is blasting. And I thought, that is a heck of a good idea. The fans love it, of course. Mm-hmm. It could, each player has this particular walk song and they all sing the song. But the player loves it. I mean, what a great idea. The same kind of thing. Gets them ready for the their at-bat. Focuses the mind. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Have you faced, like, you You must have faced because all of us face setbacks and challenges in life. But how, how do you encounter with, let's say, doubts, setbacks, or challenges when they, when they come up for you? In either your personal life or your professional life? Oh, yeah. No, I struggle with them all the time. Um. Resilience is a concept that's really important to me. And I learned that I have resilience from being an athlete when I was in high school and just doing these incredibly hard track and field workouts, you know, like 800 meter repeats, you know, 10, 800 meters minute rest in between, whatever, you know, or pyramids, 100, 200, 400, 800, 400, 300, 200, 100. Hard, hard, hard. Or a bike race I did in Northern Michigan once that was just a nightmare on beachy, sandy soil in 110 degrees. And somehow I kept going. I don't know how I did it, but I did. And so athletics have taught me resilience, physical, physical resilience but also emotional resilience and my bike climbing long, long, painful hills. And I don't know if you've ever done serious outdoor riding, but I listed all the sports I've done. Cycling is the hardest sport I've ever done. It is uniquely painful. It is uniquely suffering inducing. Something about no pounding, like running, right? Mm -hmm. just sitting there and exerting huge power output smoothly for hours. It's just hard. And going up a mountain is just incredibly hard. And I use those to boost my self-belief and confidence. But no, I struggle a lot. I still struggle emotionally. I still struggle with doubts and feeling like I can't do it. But somehow... I don't know how, somehow go to bed, get up the next day and keep going. And I think that's, a com- I think the foundation of resilience through my athletics, my f- resilience through my depressive PTSD episode have taught me that 
whatever those voices are saying to me, they're probably not being truthful. And I can keep going. Resilience is key, right? You you work with children. I know you know this. Mm -hmm. 110%. I uh, completely agree with you. I feel like you, the earlier struggles that you went through developed you into a person where you keep going. And I feel like if people keep going on, life keeps moving on. And as life keeps moving on, your things that you are struggling with, you you get the strength to overcome them because different options open, different doors open, you interact with different people, you hear different stories. And that itself is life teaching you on how to do the things that you have to. But all you have to do is just keep moving forward or as uh, what was that movie? Finding Nemo said, keep, keep swimming. Keep uh, swimming. Or as I said to my people in class, as and as I say to people I ride with outdoors, don't look at the top of the hill. It's not going in. What we need to concern ourselves with are the next 10 feet. Yes. Smart goals, short goals, achievable yes. goals. Yes. Very important. And in, in terms of building up this resiliency, um, what role would you say that family or community played for you during your life or friends uh, played for you? Mm. How supportive was that? Well, oh, Barry, I went to, um, I went to a, a, an all boys prep school for high school. It was a Jesuit school and I was raised Catholic that was related to the childhood sexual abuse of Catholic mm -hmm. priests. So I'm not Catholic anymore, but I, I love the Jesuits. I do love the Jesuits. And an all-boys prep school, for me, at the age of 13, well, no, younger than that, I started high school at uh, just maybe turned 12. as was a year early in school. And um, at, that, at that, right, I was a kid who had pretty recently been sexually abused and being at that private Jesuit prep school, all boys prep school was really important to me for any kind of, any number of reasons. One, there's a real focus on academics and I like to learn and I was good at that. There's a real focus on integrity and ethics, which has stayed with me. And they also had really great athletics, which I loved. And there was none of the noise of uh, competition for for uh, female attention. None of it. it was, there was none there. There was none of the noise of what clothes are you wearing today because we had to wear, you know, <laughs> collar shirt and, and corduroys. So we got to just be ourselves. And... I was in the science club and I was six in the state in class A in the long jump. And there's no contradiction there, right? As a receiver mm -hmm. on the football team and also the number one biology student. No contradiction there. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I love that model of becoming a, a, a man. That's my model, the, the road scholars in athletics have always been that for me, the, the college student who is an athlete, but is also really good in academics. And that is the Rhodes Scholarship. So I say all that because those those guys are still on my phone. We have, we have a group text of all mm -hmm. those guys. Mm -hmm. And we're like, hey, Ryan, what's going on? What's going on? We're all still there for each other, you know? That's and that's really important. Graduate school is very similar, but for different reasons. Serious intellectual work, terrifying days punctuated by sheer um, boredom because, you know, you're grading tests forever. But graduate school was very similar to that for me and my, my close-knit group in my laboratory, plus my academic work. So friendships and and, and the, the people who were in doing these things with me. Are, are still with me in my life to the same. In fact, right after COVID happened, a bunch of my lab mates from my graduate school lab, and I had a, had some Zoom meetings. 
and we just hey how's it going all talked and just had a good catching up it, so those are important parts of my life and those are I, I think having that is really really important for people isolation is the opposite of that and that's not good for people yeah having people around you that value you that care for you that would be there for you in good and bad times or are supportive it's, it's extremely important extremely important and if you're if you're vulnerable and open then you know those people know the real you mm -hmm. and therefore you don't feel like you're pulling a fast one on them if you need their support but you're thinking well but they don't know this about me they don't know this uh, if you're open and honest i feel like then you can really learn to accept people's caring for you because they know you and they accept you and for being open and honest, I feel like you have to be first accepting of yourself and uh, be comfortable in the skin that you yourself are in. That's an excellent point. I hadn't thought of that. But yes, because then otherwise, shame and guilt will overpower you. And then those defense mechanisms come in mm -hmm. that don't allow you to really see, see yourself for who you are because it's too painful. And therefore, the defense mechanisms... Ah, that's an interesting point. You must you must accept yourself at some level in order to be vulnerable. Is that is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that's what that's what I mean. Because then, if you're not accepting, um, uh, and if you have made like you know this big fear within your mind, then you're not gonna be open. You're not gonna be honest. You're always gonna be fearful around people. I feel like that's fascinating. That's fascinating. I have read about things like um borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, cluster B, you know what I mean, cluster B personality mm -hmm. disorder. And the source of those is internal shame and guilt that can't be faced. Now, you're more an expert on this than I am, but that's how I understand it. And so uh, a shell, uh, a face, what, what's the word they call the, the mask? A shell mm -hmm. or a mask is created to keep people from seeing that. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes so entrained that you don't see it anymore. And it becomes subconscious or unconscious. And your defense mechanism will keep you from that. And you go through life with these behavior patterns that are the opposite of vulnerability. And I feel like you, how, how do you feel around building up the community that you're building up with whatever cycle? How do I feel about it? Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, the community we built over seven years is, uh, it's like a rip, you know, you know the, the image people use of the little stone dropping into the pond and the ripple spreading, right? Mm -hmm. I was just the stone when it first hit the water. That studio was, not me, that studio was. I know 100% that those ripples have traveled a long way and are still going. I, I know that. And we've been closed four years now. I know that they are. And that is good work. If you, can get it. if you can get that kind of work, it's good work. I'm very very proud of the work we did there. And I rank it up there with my work as a professor at Davidson in North Carolina and at Indiana. I dedicated myself to those jobs. I believed deeply in what we were doing. I was passionate about learning and teaching and seeing light bulbs go on for people. And so my teaching at those two universities or colleges and my work at Revo Cycle, I point over there because it's three blocks that way, um, profoundly important to me. And I know for a fact the communities, I, I, I guarantee people remember my classes from Davidson and, and Indiana. In fact, I'll tell you a funny short story. When I moved to Portland, Oregon, about a year and a half after I was here, I was walking down a street nearby here. And a car slowed down and someone said, hey, Dr. Hoskin. <laughs> I was like, what? Nobody calls me that here, right? Because I'm just Michael here. It was one of my students from Davidson in North Carolina who saw me uh, walking down the street. And <laughs> he jumped out of his car and came up and gave me a big hug. 
and That's I just say, hey man, good to see you. Good to see you. I forgot he was from Oregon. I forgot that he was. I so I know those people are all over the place from the studio and from my teaching, and I'm very proud of the work. And it has nothing in particular to do with me. It has a lot to do with commitment and values and integrity that I hope to share with people. Yeah, and I feel like the the work that you're doing, the project, the company that you have, it's it's just so meaningful work because you're you're combining a lot of elements that connect with a lot of people, but people are unable to connect with it in some moments of time because of how busy their schedules are, like mindfulness, like biking and music, bringing them all together and not focusing on the numbers, not focusing on how you look. That is extremely needed and like people feel seen, I feel like, with this work. Like sure. I feel seen. I feel seen. I haven't I, I live in Colorado. You're based in Oregon. I've we've never met in person, but just hearing around the project and the the work that that Rebel Cycle is doing, it's I wish I had one over here in Colorado because it's it connects just the right elements like mindfulness, music, biking. Focusing on your inner self, focusing on your holistic well-being in a way and not completely focused on what the numbers are or how you look or how old you are or how young you are. It's it's very powerful. You you, you described it beautifully. Yeah, 100%. You're right. I, I think it's important work. I think, yeah, you know, the industry has very little of this even to this day. I, I mean, I, I'm trying to think. There was a, a rowing, indoor rowing um studio in London a few years ago that talked about exercise for mental health. But I can't think of another fitness brand, specifically a studio bit concept, where they're teaching mindfulness based movement, exercise for mental health, meditative exercise, holistic well being, I can't think of one. Mm -hmm. And I think it, especially in today's, in today's time and age, when Things are so busy. Things are so chaotic. Social media is always popping you up, like notifications. Your phone's always buzzing. The younger folks, by younger folks, I mean anyone under the age of 20, they're completely occupied by computer screens, video games. Virtual reality is also now coming in. So we are gearing ourselves towards a future where it would be more connected with tech, more connected with technology, more connected with chaos, short, short attention span time. And with the, the work that you are doing, and it's just very promising because it's very much needed. I totally agree. In fact, when I started the studio 2010 or so, no, 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 2012 or so, um, everyone was like, oh, you should put a projector in and you should show like videos. And I remember thinking, I don't, I don't want them distracted. I don't want people to be distracted. <laughs> and as you say, now there are indoor cycling studios that have this huge. That have 10 screens. I have I, a, my. Like there's no wall unscreened. There's no second unyelled at. There's no moment. It is more and more and more distraction and it's just moving in that direction if we can surround you with even more colors and lights and sounds and pictures the better it will be and i just fundamentally disagree with that and i don't think i'm wrong i think you can ask any athlete in the world any real athlete in the world and they will tell you that their movement is a meditative practice Runners, climbers, rowers, hikers, paddlers, uh, basketball players. Basketball players for sure, right? Michael Jordan used to talk about getting in the flow state, right? I don't remember the last four minutes of the game. Mm -hmm. Don't remember, right? Athletes will tell even, you. The, even Muhammad Ali used to talk about it, the boxer. Oh, don't even start with them. I love Muhammad Ali. And in fact, I have watched several of his fights in the last week. Old fights from the days when he was Cassius Clay mm -hmm. to when he became Muhammad Ali. And I watch it not because I love boxing. I don't love boxing. In fact, I kind of like, oh, God, you know. But his movement is as beautiful as any ballet you will ever see. 
The man was absolutely poetry in motion. And his reflexes and his speed and his movement around the ring were phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal. And I watched those fights, not because I like to see people beating each other up. I like to see beautiful movement. And also, I like him as a human being. And I, I admire his integrity and his courage. And so, yeah. Yes, Muhammad Ali. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. I think it, he's one of the greatest examples for, like, you know, the topic that we're talking about or the work that you're doing. It's Abs absolutely beautiful. There was a fight he had with uh, Foreman, Frazier, can't remember which, Frazier, Frazier, I think. The Thrill in Manila, they call it. 15 round bout. And it was in 100 something degrees temperature outdoors. And I don't know if you've ever done boxing exercise, but it is hard. And you're talking to a bike racer here. It's hard. Like the closest I've ever come to throwing up from a workout was a boxing workout. <laughs> oh, and a track and field workout. I mean, it is hard. And these guys were going at it in 100 plus degree temperatures, 14 rounds. And by the end of the 14th round, those guys were absolutely exhausted. And no one could understand how they were able to keep going. And 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 by the way, they called the fight at the end of that. The, the his opponent, I think it was Frazier, did not come out. So Ali won. But Ali will tell you, he he remembers those middle rounds sitting there in between rounds thinking, I cannot go on. I cannot go on. And yet somehow he did. Powerful. Powerful. I, I totally agree. Yep. I, I, go ahead. I was just going to say it's his mental strength. Very much. Very he much just, mental strength. He did not know how to give up, and which is why sometimes your body just goes in that trance where you just keep going on. You don't remember the last rounds. And it's weird to know that when you're watching this because he's sitting there in, the, in between rounds just looking exhausted, right? And somehow he's up with the bell and his arms are it's it's amazing to me mm -hmm. it's just amazing to me yes I, and so he's an athlete yes just like that but all athletes will tell you it's beautiful i'm sure muhammad ali would talk about working the heavy bag for an hour in his training you know and it just becomes the world comes down to that and it's just you in the bag and you in the bag and mm -hmm. meditate for any listeners, young or old, any age, how would you recommend them to take that first step towards their fitness or take their first, that first step towards their mindfulness uh, journey? Well, uh, I would combine both. I do mindful movement and I, I, I teach people two things. One is get rid of the all or nothing thinking because almost everybody who starts a fitness program of some sort is in all or nothing thinking because they've usually spent months or years going, I really need to work out. I really need to work out. You know, And then they finally go, I'm going to do it. And that is an all or nothing mindset. And they go, I'm going to do it four times a week. And then inevitably life gets in the way, something happens. And by the second week you've missed one or two. And now with that all or nothing thinking, you're like, well, today's ruined. Might as well just eat some, you know, whatever, and, and go to bed. And then the next day you go, well, I mean, yesterday was ruined. It's not going to really hurt much more to not do anything today. And then pretty soon you're going, well, that week was ruined. It doesn't really matter. if it. And pretty soon you've given up. All or nothing thinking is really harmful for dieting, for, for exercising. So I say stop the all or nothing thinking, which means then take the week you want to start and, and just do it twice. Just do it twice. Whatever it is, do it twice. And then the other thing I would say is do it mindfully and tune into the intrinsic rewards. Intrinsic meaning internal within us versus extrinsic rewards, which are things like how people see my muscles or <laughs> medals or trophies or people are going to think I'm hot. Those are extrinsic to you. Think about the intrinsic rewards. And do your movement mindfully. And do just tiny little bits, tiny, tiny, tiny little bits. 
they call them exercise snacks. And I, I'd say do five, 10 minutes of a mindfulness walk, a mindfulness jog, pick it three blocks away, jog to it. But as you do it, pay attention to how your body feels, your knees feel, your hips feel, your muscles working. Where do you feel the pressure? What's your heart rate doing? How's your breathing doing? Is it painful? Is it not painful? What's the speed feel like? What's the sound of your feet, right? You, I could do this all day long. There, there's an infinite number of things you can pay attention to. Pay attention to them and do it for short distances. And then only do it a couple times a week and then start to add in after a few weeks as you start to build in the habit and you're not doing all or nothing thinking. Take step by step, baby steps. And yes. like ex expect something of you that you can achieve rather than something setting achieve. up yourself, setting yourself up for goals that might be too difficult. That's correct. That, that's exactly right. And when you do that, you then get the sense of satisfaction of achieving the goal. And that builds what we call self-efficacy, right. which is the primary goal of mine in what I teach, is teaching people self-efficacy. Mm -hmm. How do you, where do you see this industry moving towards? How do you see it evolving in the next few years with now technology and with uh, all the different apps that we have that can keep track of, like, you know, even the little movements that we do? How do you see this industry evolving in the next few years? I think I see it going in the direction of what they're calling the quantified self. Do you know what that means? It's more related to us being compared with the highest things that we can achieve, like as computerized objects? It, it, it's, yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting angle. It's related to that. That's good. It, we're increasingly able to buy devices that can measure aspects of our physiology. And because these devices are becoming more powerful and cheaper, companies are now selling them to fitness people as a way of quantifying their physiology, their function. And these things, I mean, you could, the, the natural end point of this is that you're measuring everything, but to what end, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like that's the wrong direction for the industry to be going because getting people more and more and more addicted to devices that are measuring aspects of their functioning is just more distraction. And these devices are all connected and have their own infrared rays and all that stuff that could damage your body too. Well, and then there's that potential. Yes. So I, I just, that's a strong trend in the industry right now, quantifying things, and then throwing them into computer programs and then onto cloud-based data storage places where now some company has access to very private, almost medical data mm -hmm. of yours that you're willingly offering up. I like. I, I don't think this is a good trend at all. I don't like it and I argue against it on LinkedIn, but that makes sense now that you know where I'm coming from. Like, your body can give you all the information you need. Listen to it. Listen to it. How do you feel today? How are your muscles working today? What's your breathing doing? How's this hill feel today compared to last week? Better. Huh? What did you eat? Did you sleep better? Are you feeling better? This it, Your body will tell you this if you just listen. I think this quantified self is more of the distraction angle that fitness loves to sell. So that's a major trend. I don't like it. I fitness think it's coming... Hmm? Sorry, now I was just going to say, I think it's coming up more from the sports and sports sites because th this technology, this data, th these statistics are already, they already exist within the athletes. And now they're getting trickled down and implemented to a regular average Jack, Joe and Jill. But the whole difference is that these athletes have all these meal plans and all this excessive or exclusive uh, access to the top quality food supply. Uh, mm -hmm. that their body can handle that much of work or their body can handle that much of like, you know, being monitored. Whereas for an average Jack, Joe and Jill, they, they probably eat McDonald's or they probably don't eat that he healthy uh, in their daily uh, routine with which I feel like these statistics are doing more damage to them. than Yeah. Them. 
I, yeah, right. You're you're absolutely right. It's coming from athletics or, or professional sports, and those are professionals. Therefore, mm-hmm. for the money they're getting paid, someone's going to say to them, "I demand <laughs> you collect all these data on what you eat and how you sleep and how you work out." And we're going to analyze it to optimize you, like like the six million dollar man from the seventies. Mm-hmm. If your listeners don't know what that is, look it up. It's a story about mm-hmm. a man that was horribly injured in a, I think, some kind of space related um, accident, and they rebuilt him better and stronger than he was. He became a machine. And athletes today are almost like that. And. You know, they're getting paid a lot of money. I can see why the owners of the teams and the coaches are saying, we we want to quantify you and really optimize you. But mm-hmm. in fitness, uh, you know, I think that's more distraction. And I think it, it drowns out your body speaking to you anyway. And like, you're not winning anything in fitness. There's, mm-hmm. Like there's no competition. So I, I'm not a huge fan of those. I mean, I get how they, they work, and I know these tools are interesting, but I don't use any of them. I, I, don't, I use nothing. I took my computer off my road bike many years ago, the c- computer that could tell me distance, time, miles. I, I used to ride religiously with that computer, and it became obsession to me. Mm-hmm. And I realized I don't like riding my bike very much anymore because it becomes stressful. If I don't do this route in a certain amount of time, then it was a bad ride. If I take too long to make it up this hill, then that's a bad climb. You're no longer doing it for the right reasons, Klaus. Correct. It, it became my taskmaster. And I didn't want that. It made me unhappy. I like my bike. And suddenly, I rides became stressful and something I had to do. So I don't even have a computer on my bike. And so I'm not a huge fan of this whole quantified self. That's happening. Um, There is a movement towards exercise for mental health. There are people beyond me talking about this. There is a group that I'm on the advisory board for. In fact, I would like your readers and listeners to know about this. There's a foundation called the John W. Brick Foundation, and you can look it up. They have a nice website. And John W. Brick Foundation focuses on alternative approaches, holistic approaches, to treating mental health and preventing mental health issues. And I'm on their advisory board. And one of their main things they focus on is how exercise and mindfulness can boost mental health. So your listeners, I would highly recommend go to their website. They have a free report where they summarize 30 years of the science of exercise for mental health, research papers, summarize. Mm -hmm. For free, 30 years of research. So I would go to the the John W. Brick Foundation. They call it the John W. Brick Mental Health Foundation and, and look through some of the resources. They're a really good organization. They're promoting exercise for mental health. And more and more, we're starting to see companies talk about exercise for mental health, which is really good to see. Well, no, I'll, I'll definitely check it out tonight because that sounds something that I would be personally very interested in. And uh, I'll also share it up with, with, with the users and with the audience as uh, in, in the description as well. Um, so just to wrap things up a little bit, what message or advice you'd give to anyone who might be struggling with mental wellness? Well, the first thing I always say to people is, I get it. I get this. I I understand. And I would tell people, this is not a personal failing. It is is not a weakness. It's not a shortcoming. That it's part of being human. Like a stomach ache. Or stepping wrong on the path and twisting your ankle. And it's no more shameful than twisting your ankle on a hike. And that talking with other people about it, being vulnerable with the right people, always be careful about that. 
is, I think, essential. I think it's essential. Talking with other people, recognizing you're not alone, hearing their stories, sharing your story. The vulnerability and the connection will help you to start to get through it. And if you need to take medicines, take your medicines. If you need to go to the therapist, go to the therapist. Go to the therapist. That's what I would say. Go to the therapist. After all of that, go to the therapist. Carve some time out for yourself. Treat it like a way of taking care of your health. That's beautiful. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. And my last question would be, just to wrap up this whole conversation, is what would you what would your top three or top five music recommendations be for 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 the listeners who might be going out for a jog or who might be going out for a bike ride or something? Well, I, okay, so it has to be with fitness then. All right, so that leaves out. I mean, jazz, jazz. Uh, you know, here's I'll, I'll give you a couple. I'm looking at my records right now. You know, I like. I really, for my workouts, walking, jogging, riding my bike, indoors, not outdoors. I really like electronic music, and I like thoughtful electronic music. So I'll give you two, three, artists, that you might like. And this is wordless music. There are no lyrics. I'll start with um, the name of the album is called Oxygene. It's spelled Oxygene, O-X-Y-G-E-N-E. -E. It's French, I think, for oxygen. And it's, I forget the artist's name, but if you look it up, it is the seminal electronic record. It's from 1976 or so. And it's a Frenchman's name, Jean. I'll, I'll come up with it in a second. Oxygen. It's it's like the classic. It's the first. It started all electronic music long before computers. They were using little circuits to make electronic sounds. I already mentioned this one, but it's it, this artist to me is amazing. John Hopkins, J-O-N Hopkins. And Singularity is the record that turned me on to him. And we, we actually did a vinyl night ride to that in our studio. And it was just goosebump inducing. And then Boards of Canada, they have a record called uh, Music Has the Right to Children. Music Has the Right to Children. And those, yeah, Music Has the Right to Children. So, I can't remember. Jare, Jare, Jare is the first one. Oxygen, I think that's it, but you can look it up. Oxygen, mm -hmm. second one was John Hopkins, Singularity. The third one is Music Has a Right to Children, the Boards of Canada. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I'm going to go for a jog right after this recording, and I'll definitely be listening to all, all three of them. Oh, try, uh, try John Hopkins, <laughs> Singularity. It builds, like, he's a classical trained composer. It builds, and it's mm -hmm. also emotional. I can't wait to hear what you think about it. I'll definitely keep you posted. But thank you so much, Michael, for uh, joining me for this podcast. This was probably the most inspired I felt while recording one because the information and the knowledge that you provided up today was really priceless. And I really appreciate the work that you're doing within the community um, because it's very much needed. It's People need to be valued. People need to be seen. People need to be provided with opportunities and chances to not just follow what the latest trend is, but to follow the trend within their bodies and to connect with their bodies, to connect with themselves. And I, I feel like that's something that you're doing. Yeah, it's ultimately, you know, as I'm thinking about it, it's ultimately what I'm teaching people. So listen to themselves, come to know themselves, accept themselves and share themselves. Yes. And if someone wants to reach out to you or get in touch with you, what's the best way uh, for them to reach out to you, would you say? I, you know, they can email me at michael at revocycle.com, R-E-V-O-C-Y-C-L-E.com, or just find me on LinkedIn. I, I connect with lots and lots and lots of people on LinkedIn. I love to do it. So Michael Hosking, PhD on LinkedIn. Got you. And I'll also add up your links in the description, and we'll also share it as a B-roll footage as well. But... Thank you again, Michael. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing. Thank you for being here today. And I 
wish you all the very best and all the projects that you work on uh, and hopefully one day maybe we can do a part two for this because i feel like there are still a lot of topics and a lot of areas that we can cover yeah. up yeah yeah happy to yeah happy to i love i love talking about all this stuff this is my work this is my work thank you so much thank you thank you for being here you're welcome thank you